If you are comfortably able, would you remain standing to honor God's Word? This morning it comes to us from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go. Go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. You know, the human race has always been troubled by what happens after we die. In the ancient world, some people believe that when you die, you go out like a candle. There was an ancient tombstone epitaph that was so popular that we, archaeologists have discovered this in both Greek and in Latin, and it read this, I was not, I was, I am not, I don't care. It's not the cheerful, positive way we like to end, but that's what they believed. This is a line of thinking for several people, many people. Some of you might remember the name, uh, the name Mel Blanc. He was the voice between, of all those cartoon characters. Remember the Looney Tunes, Mel Blanc? At the very end of every movie, you would see Porky Pig come onto the screen, and he would always say the same thing. That's all, folks. Remember this? A couple of years ago, Mel Blanc died. Anyone want to guess what his family put on his tombstone? <laughs> That's all, folks. And maybe the question for us this morning on this Easter Sunday is which is true? He is risen indeed, or that's all, folks. Does death mean that the show is over, or is it possible that somewhere the real show is just starting? Let us pray. Oh Lord, by your Spirit, we humbly ask that you would speak to us your word, your eternal word, the eternal truth of the risen one, Jesus from Nazareth who came for us and for our salvation. Amen. Early on a Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, they made their way, these three women, to the tomb to anoint the dead body of Jesus. Mark tells us that these women had watched the crucifixion from a distance. When it was all over, they saw Joseph of Arimathea pull the dead body off the cross, wrap it in a linen cloth, lay it in a tomb hewn out of a rock, and then they watched the stone rolled over the door of the tomb. These three women had watched all of this from a distance, Mark says. Years ago, when our two children, then two children, Andrew and Hannah, were, were, were young, we took them to a son's basketball game. I was an a, a associate pastor just starting out ministry, didn't have a lot of money, so we had to sit in the, we bought tickets in the real cheap seats, way up high. And I have to tell you, the four of us were there watching this game, and it was maybe the worst game I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, the Suns were terrible, and they were getting blown out, and people were booing. It wasn't good basketball. It just, it just was not good at all. So at halftime, we went down into the concourse area to try and find some food for the kids. And, and a man came up to me and he said, he looked me up and down, he looked at our kids and he, he said, 
I need to tell you something. I said, what? He said, I'm out of here. <laughs> he said, okay. He says, this is awful. They're playing terrible. This is awful. I said, okay. And then he looked at me and he said, here, take these tickets, give your kids a treat. I thought, okay, thank you. And he bolted out. And I looked at the tickets and I thought, you know, I have a funny feeling these are pretty good. <laughs> so we started to walk down. I'd never walked down before. We'd always walked up. <laughs> We're walking down, and we kept going and going and going and going. Our four tickets were at midcourt on the floor. How many of you sat at midcourt on the floor before? I have. <laughs> we went from the upper rafters to on the floor, midcourt. Talk about a change. And suddenly, the sun started playing better. <laughs> no lie. They started catching up. The game was exciting. It was amazing. Sitting on the floor, you're looking up at seven footers. It's the most amazing thing. <clears throat> there is nothing like being at, I know this now, there's nothing like being at an NBA game on the floor. But it was more than that. The cheerleaders came over and they greeted Hannah and said hi to her and were giving her high fives and introducing themselves to her. At one point during an intermission, the gorilla, you know the mascot, the gorilla, he came over and he sat on Andrew, on our son. <laughs> and he laughed and he laughed. And the sons won that game. I think about that sometimes. Because an invitation was given to us to move from a great distance to suddenly being a part of the action. Suddenly we moved from spectators that were watching something and we were bored and discouraged to suddenly we were now a part of what was going on. Today... Easter Sunday, an invitation is being extended. It's being extended to you to begin the resurrection life. This life changes everything. It's an invitation to be a part of something that is going on in our world that is glorious and wonderful and purposeful. This invitation is extended to you and to me this day. These women, these three women, were watching from a distance, but they didn't stay there. They were pulled into the drama. They were suddenly given front row seats. They, they arrived that Sunday morning to give Jesus a, a proper burial. That was the custom. And they looked up and they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was a huge stone. And they, they walked into the tomb and there they saw a young man sitting on the right side dressed in all white. They were astonished. Completely taken aback. And he said, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, the one that they nailed on the cross. He has been raised up. He is here no longer. See for yourselves the place where he was. It's empty. He's not here now. Go on your way. Do you hear this? You're now a part of the team. You're part of the action. You've been pulled into the drama of God's unfolding drama to, to save this world. These women were brought into it. Now go on your way. Tell the others. Tell the disciples. Tell Peter that he's going on ahead of you to Galilee. You're going to see him there exactly as he said. And so they went out and fled from that tomb. Mark tells us, for terror and amazement had seized them. Terror and amazement. All of their beliefs about death being the end had suddenly been shattered. Who would not be afraid at that moment? But also amazement. If this is true, anything can be possible. Terror and amazement seize them. According to Mark, 
the first Easter begins not with people standing and singing, Jesus Christ is risen today. The first Easter begins with three women running frantically out of a cemetery. All of their beliefs about death have been shattered in an instant. Their belief that that's all, folks, and all, that's all, folks, has now been changed to he is risen indeed. It is very possible in our world today to watch the events of Easter, to watch the resurrection from a distance. It's quite easy, actually. Actually, you can be in church every Sunday and still watch it all from a distance. You can be in Bible study every week and still kind of keep it at arm's length and, and never really experience it. You might have a lot of head knowledge about it or understand some things, but it is possible. Why? Why would we keep the resurrection at arm's length? Why would we sit in the cheap seats when we've been invited to be a part of the drama? I think there are a number of reasons. I want to highlight just three briefly this morning. One is, I think we, we tend to think of ourselves as quite smart, quite scientific. We think that we can outthink people because we live in our age. We think that ancient people were somehow gullible or naive. They didn't understand the way the world works. And so they, they just wanted to believe in this and they, they maybe had some feelings about it. Lewis calls this chronological snobbery. Every generation thinks it's more enlightened and smarter than the one before. The ancient people of Jesus' day were not stupid. They understood something really important that we need to understand also, that the dead tend to stay dead. Ken Davis tells the story of a woman who looked out her window and, he, and she saw that her German shepherd was shaking the life out of a neighbor's rabbit in its mouth. Now, her family did not get along well with these neighbors, so she knew that this was going to end in disaster. She grabbed a broom and began pummeling the dog until it dropped the dead rabbit from its mouth. Seeing the dead rabbit, she panicked, she grabbed it, she took it inside, she gave it a bath, she blow-dried it <laughs> to its original fluffiness. And she snuck into the neighbor's yard, propped it back up in its cage. But an hour later, she heard screaming, screams coming from next door. And she asked her neighbor what was going on. And she said, our rabbit, our rabbit. The neighbor cried, he died two weeks ago. We buried him and now he's back. <laughs> Friends, people in the ancient world, as we do, know that dead rabbits stay dead. <laughs> N.T. Wright says this, he says, there were many messianic movements in the first century. In every case, the would-be Messiah got crucified by Rome. This is nothing new. There were all kinds of people that rose up and people followed them. They entered into Rome, a lot of fanfare, you're going to be the one. And each and every time they were crucified. But in not one single case do we hear the slightest mention of the disappointed followers claiming that their hero had been raised from the dead. They knew better. From the report of these women, they told the others, death doesn't have the final word on your life or on our life. A movement started. Jesus was raised from the dead, they said. And that movement spread. That movement went to all the world and it grew and it continues until today. It's hard to fathom that the, the, the movement that is the church that started that day, that Sunday morning, could, be, could have such an impact on our world and continue to spread on our world today based on a myth conjured up by these three women. It's hard to fathom that. They understood Something happened to them, and it changed their lives, and it changed the lives of the disciples. 
and it continues to change the lives of men and women today. You know, another reason why we stay in the cheap seats and we keep an arm's distance to this life of faith and, and the resurrection is, is quite simply and, and quite honestly, it's because of the church. The church does not always do well. This is a sad thing to have to say and admit. The church does not always do well. Sometimes it fails us. There, the, the past season we've been living through has had scandal on scandal on scandal in the Catholic Church, in the Protestant Church, fallen leaders, celebrity pastors that don't look like Jesus much at all. There is an overabundance of wealth. The church does not have a great track record, and it goes through seasons, and it goes through times, and maybe we're living in a hard time of the church right now. And because of that, we have a lot of people in our society, in our city right now, who are keeping an arm's length because of that, and they're deconstructing their faith. They're asking a lot of questions and trying to deconstruct it all and, and, and questioning everything. And maybe that's okay. I mean, the Protestant Reformation was a deconstruction on some level. But you can't live there. You can maybe go through a season of questioning a number of things and trying to rebuild a faith, but you, you still, at the end of the day, have to answer the question, did he rise? Yes, he did. <laughs> and if he did, all things are made brand new. Sometimes we have to push through in spite of the church to find the Savior. Maybe the third reason why we keep Easter at a distance is our own pride. It's our own shame. You know, I think back to that day when that man gave us the sun's tickets. I, I could have responded differently. I mean, I, I could have said when he offered me these tickets, I, I could have said, wait a minute, um, what, what, do you, what do I look like, a charity case? I mean, I've worked hard to get these seats. I, I, I'm proud of who, of who I am and who we are. I, I, don't, I don't need your charity. And I would have missed, we would have missed the invitation. But I suspect there's a bigger reason. And that is our own personal shame. And we get to a point where we say, I, I understand Jesus, and I understand that maybe he was raised, but if that's true, it wasn't for me. Not after what I've done. Not after the thoughts I've had. Not after the half promises. Not after the hurt I have caused. Not after the years of apathy and, and, and pain and addiction. Maybe this resurrection thing is a gift for the saints, but it's not for me. It's too much hurt. It's too much pain. You know, the angel in the tomb said a very curious thing if you were listening close. The angel said, go to these women, go and tell the disciples and Peter. It's a little redundant, isn't it? Peter is one of the disciples. Why would we name Peter? Why is he singled out? You know, what's interesting about the book of Mark is most scholars believe this is actually, Mark wrote down Peter's remembrance of what happened. Peter knows this very, very well. You remember Peter denied Jesus three times. In the hour of need. Jesus predicted that he would deny him three times. And Peter did deny him three times. Where is Peter right about now? Shame. I can't believe what I did. I cannot believe that I denied my Lord. I cannot believe. He predicted I would do it, and I did it. And, and, and Peter's thinking all of this. I'm lost. I'm hopeless. Woe is me. And the angel says, I want you to go and tell Peter specifically. Peter, you are not lost. Peter, his grace extends to you. Peter, you are loved now more than you could ever imagine. 
at the depth of his shame over what he had done, Jesus wanted him to know, you're not beyond reach, Peter. In fact, I'm bringing you in. In fact, the invitation, Peter, comes to you. You get the invitation, Peter. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've thought, Peter, tell Peter, tell him. Tell Peter that here's tickets, front row seats, and, and I need him to be a part of this drama. Tell Peter that he's the one that I'm going to use and work with. That denying, sniveling traitor, tell him. Peter. What brought you here this morning? Some of us are here to carry out a traditional rite of spring, and that includes flowers, chocolate, annual visit to church. That's good. They're all good. Maybe you're here to support a family member for whom this is a very important day. Or maybe deep down in your soul, maybe really deep down, there's some stirring going on. Maybe you're hoping to find something or someone to breathe some freshness, some purpose into your own soul. Maybe you came today because the living Christ, the resurrected one, is at the center of your life, and all you want to do today is praise Him and give Him glory for that wonderful reality. Or maybe some of us are just going through some, some motions today. It's been a hard year, a difficult year. The job has become burdensome. The lack of work has become a source of pain and loneliness. Or maybe the relationship that you thought would bring life has become a burden. And maybe in the back of your mind you're wondering, is there more to life than this? Today, this Resurrection Sunday, I pray that you will hear the call and receive the invitation that has been placed before you to begin eternal life, resurrection life, today. Today, you can begin chapter one of this story. This story goes on for eternity. And in this story, the best part is we get to be with Jesus. And every chapter is better than the one before. Will you pray with me? Father, in these brief moments of quiet, perhaps we would think about accepting your invitation to life. To say to you, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins and I'm ready to begin the resurrection life. I'm, I'm tired of watching from a distance and I want to be a part of this great drama and be a part of the action that you've called me to. If so, perhaps you could tell the risen Lord now in this, these moments of quiet. Today, Father, we thank you for raising Jesus from the dead. And so our best word, our best word today is thank you. Our best words today are hallelujah. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.